So Nikki, thanks so much for joining me in conversation. It's, uh, it's a real pleasure to, to talk to you. We're just going to have a, a chat about your work, your career, your films that you've made, um, and we'll talk about your processes. So how did you end up being an animator? Was it something you always wanted to do? I think it's been quite a winding road, if that's the right word. I think it's it's been... Uh, uh, it, I, I, I didn't really have that in mind from the beginning. I, I was more... Actually, I studied... I studied prop making when I was about 19 uh, for two years in Sweden, uh, like prop making and uh, set design to mainly just build things uh, for uh, film and stage and things like that. Um, so I, I, since I have like this, you know, sort of a little bit of a background in, in the art world since my parents work a lot with art and, and like I come from quite um, like the sort of art world that's not perhaps like perhaps not like the you know highbrow art world, but a bit more like the sort of anarchist uh, kind of art world. So I, I I've always felt like there was like a, quite a lot of space for me to be creative, and I, I always loved to be creative. But I didn't want to be that. I, I didn't want to be like a full blown you know artist because I just felt that that was like it was like the lack of like routines and lack of just like normal life really like uh, didn't feel good to me. Uh, my dad is an artist also. Um, so I sort of wanted to, to work creatively but within some sort of framing. Uh, so then I, I um, uh, yeah I chose to, to uh, study prop making because that's also like you, you, you have your share of creativity and you, you um, uh, you build things and you get to know materials and you have your yeah you can have your way with that but then it's still someone who's ordering something from you you have like an employer and you have a deadline and these things were quite important to me um, but then I sort of I mean I, I did that uh, for a few years um, but then I also I, I actually I did I did make like a very first like not not a, not an animated film, but sort of a puppeteer kind of film uh, as a, a, an exam work from that school uh, where I went, and that film just happened to like be accepted to a couple of like Swedish film festivals, like Gothenburg Film Göteborg Film Festival, and um, all of a sudden I I found myself in this uh, film industry uh, in the middle of that and. And I just sort of realized that uh, I, re of course, I've always loved film as well. Not necessarily animated film. I, I, I don't see that much animated film, to be totally honest. But, but, uh, but film in general, um, it's always been a huge interest. And I, I just felt that how can I combine this love for materials and like to make things with also making film and like telling stories. I've been such like, I always loved storytelling so much. So then, like, because of that, I, I sort of got interested in, in stop frame animation, especially, not necessarily like uh, 2D, even though I think that can be quite beautiful as well, but, but something about like, you know, making puppets and making these sets and these tiny worlds on your own and be able to decide everything. Like total control freak, obviously, <laughs> but I think that was the that was the case, or that, that was sort of the situation that that made me uh, start working with stop frame animation, and also of course, sorry, also of course, just um, uh, after a while, after like after a while, when I uh, when I've been doing um, these films and also um, and also. Uh, prop making also I, I started out uh, started to go to fine art school anyway so I, I became <coughs> I have an education as an artist as well which uh, was a bit like I couldn't go too far from my dad's <laughs> I don't know legacy after all and, and just on that point then, yeah so you mentioned your dad was an artist mm. And I, I heard that your parents ran a gallery mm. can you tell us a bit about that and just like what what how did that influence you growing mm. up? 
I think I, I've been. I, it was. It was. It's been a quite um, a little bit of a bohemian childhood, I'd say. I mean, a lot of like parties and a lot of people, like like grown-up people, like friends of like my 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 parents and my family have a lot of friends. So it's like always been a quite a social. Um, situation around me and and you sort of like I sort of grew up on this um, um, like exhibition openings you know eating the snacks and just like uh, mingling with like grown-ups <laughs> so because I also my mom was quite young when she had me so and I also have a younger sister but I think her upbringing has been quite different because then everyone had small kids so she had like this herd of small kids while I was sort of alone being a small kids. So I was very like used to spending time with this uh, um, with this older like weird artist somehow. So so I, I, I think that we didn't have like we 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 didn't have that much money since my parents are like yeah come from like artists and, and uh, uh, but it's been very much like you also get some sort of confidence since you have all of this kind of cultural uh, context around you uh, that uh, that you don't really. I, I feel like confident. I, I always felt like confident in that that I can be creative and I can be an artist because it's obviously working. Even though I'm not making that much money, it will sort of like work out. Uh, so that's that's quite a nice thing to have, I think. Um, and. Uh, um, so like, I, I, like, because I, I think that would sort of be the difference from me and perhaps other people with other backgrounds that I've always felt like, yeah, I could, I could do art, I could do films, whatever, you know, instead of like, yeah, you should really be like a, uh, a doctor, you should be a lawyer. Like, I, my parents have never been like that. What's interesting is, is that how like your work, your films, they, I think I showed them to one of my friends once and he, and he said to me, uh, these could be in a gallery. Mm. Like it, it's it's kind of work which can there's so much depth mm. like depth to it that it it can work in in several different contexts. I mm. think. Um, can you tell us a bit about like you know how you straddle these different worlds: the art mm. world, the film world, the animation world. Like right now, I feel very happy about having you know one foot in the art world and another in the film world because it really it's really hard to to just be in either i mean like it's hard to to you know uh finding the financing and everything especially in the art world of course it's really hard you're so depending on on galleries and, and yeah it's especially i think in I guess it's the same everywhere, but like in Sweden, it becomes so like everyone knows each other, and there's so much like trash talking. It's it's like it's a little bit of an unpleasant world, I would say. Um, we really need to have like really sharp elbows to sort of like get get through. Um, but um, uh, but like at first, like or in the like when I was younger, I felt that it was quite hard because when going to or like when uh, being in the film industry everyone was like yeah it's so like you know it's such art house things these things that you do and can't you be a bit more commercial sort of but then when I was like later on in the art world everyone was just like what why do you do like film this is not art this is film and this is like you're so commercial you know <laughs> and uh, uh, so it's a bit you know like um, uh, I, I had some trouble in both worlds at first, but now I feel like I've been much more like welcomed and, and I had this huge solo exhibition in Stockholm at Färfabriken uh, last fall, which was like so extremely, uh, that was such a huge success, which was so lovely because I think that the, the good thing about my films is that you get like a wider audience and, and like, so they had like, you know, they they had like such like in in visitors they had like a huge record of visitors just because you know people have seen my films on TV or they have been like they've been following me in another yeah like in another context really and and um, 
I think compared to only be, like only being an artist, it can be quite like it can be quite narrow. Unfortunately, I would love for art to be more like for for all people, but it's just sort of become like this right now, you know. Um, so, so yeah. So I want to move on to your kind of creative process and mm -hmm. like how. I mean, how do you work? How do you get ideas? Do you go through the same process for every project? Is there like something that you do each time or does everything change? Can you tell us a bit about that? It's like I've just very recently started to sort of analyzing that because like since, you know, I've only made like four films in, what is it like? 11 years or something so it's you know it takes some time in between uh, the you know startups and the the uh, developing um, you know parts of the production so but now since I have like since I finally have like a couple of films to to compare uh, to I think it's um, I know I, I do think that I I'm very much interested in the surroundings, like the the place where the film would take place, I think, I think that's my main, really, like my main sort of character uh, in my films. Uh, I just sort of noticed that that people that works, like that write scripts and directs and and things, are very much like, yeah, what 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 is the this uh, you know the main character? What's what's she like? And and uh, where does she come from? What's her story? And like doing this anal an analysis of of um, the you know actors or puppets or whatever. And and I'm just like I don't really care. <laughs> to me, it's like some sort of interaction with the surrounding and that character. And like the character will be sort of uh, what do you say? Like the, the the surrounding is is like also sort of someone who's like affecting the character in in different ways. Um, like for example, in Bathhouse, it's obviously a bathhouse, and that was also like the first idea I got um, to like I wanted to to make a sort of a low key drama in that kind of. Um, that kind of surrounding because it's like a very typical Swedish thing. This sort of like um, made by the you know the government in the in the 50s and 60s as a part of like the Swedish welfare systems and uh, and now they have become quite like you know quite dirty and quite worn down and no one is really like paying enough attention to them anymore. So so they've always all, almost like become a bit uh, uh, a bit. Uh, dangerous to be in sometimes because like you no one wants to sort of like uh, renovate them in in a good way uh, so i just thought that was a nice sort of symbol of the swedish welfare system as it is today <laughs> So you have those kind of those spaces which are they kind of become so significant in your films. Mm. So Tord and Tord, you have these kind of two apartments. Yeah, exactly. And also in the bird, and it's like this uh, this sort of like shopping center, like beside this huge highway. I just felt that was really like a, a sort of place that I've had like in the back of my head for years because it's also something that sort of bugs me. It's like. I feel a bit uncomfortable in this place. It's, they're like so generic, and like it's all about like car, you know, driven, consuming, and like it's not really made for people. And uh, so I think also like these places that somehow scares me. They they maybe it's some some sort of um, therapy for me to sort of like give a lot of love to them and sort of like really re like make you know build them up again in, in miniature and really like pay so much atten to attention to these details. Also in Something to Remember, there's this scene with the, the, the snail uh, in the doctor's office taking his blood pressure. And that was also, uh, I got like, I made that film just after having my first baby. And, and uh, 
I got like really sick during pregnancy, so that was quite a trauma for me. Uh, uh, so I was like constantly at the doctor's office and, and just, you know, took my blood pressure and everything. So, so that's also, I think, that sort of office also just became something that got stuck with me and that I felt that I needed to digest somehow or like, so I guess that was some kind of therapy for me. Den eviga sorgen bor inom mig, bor inom mig, sprider sig via beröring. Så om ni är rädda om era liv, vänligen håll er ifrån mig. So like, so you, you, you have these visions of like, these spaces which form a big part of your films, mm. then how do you develop these characters? And if we, if we start with Todd, Todd mm. and Todd, do you do the writing for all of your films? It's been a bit different from different films. Th that film was uh, based on a, a short story by my friend uh, Jorun Burmanberg, who's an artist, and that short story that she wrote, it's not like exactly that same story but but kind of and and it's um it's a bit more like abstract i'd say but she also made that short story based on like mental illness and like the the pre-state of schizophrenia so so and that's like why you, you tend to sort of like start seeing patterns and codes within your everyday life that doesn't necessarily exist so so it really comes from quite a dark place or like a, like a sad place somehow and so but but then it also went through me and I adapted it to a script and made things a bit more like concrete so it's I, I'd say that it's like two there's like two stories in it it's about like friendship but also about loneliness and about to me, it's about mental illness, definitely as well. But it's it's very different how people interpret it, and I I think that's nice as well. Dagen där på kändes det ovanligt tråkigt att vara ensam hemma, så jag bestämde mig för att följa upp Tords inbjudan. Kanske var han också sugen på fika. This kind of idea of the black comedy mm. or dark comedy. Um, which I think kind of gets its way into all of your all of your four films. Mm. Is that something that you're completely aware of? Were you always kind of out there to like bring in that sense of humour? Actually, no. I, I think, which is a bit, I don't know, which is a bit sad. I guess it's like I always aim for doing something quite dark. Like, like always when I start with a new project, it's like now I'm getting like you know dark for real, and now it's like. No, this is like horror, you know, and then like I always end up with like this sort of like not totally unintentional humor, but they, there's always like humorous situations, obviously because there are like animals and there's um, there's just like so many like so so much silliness coming out from like this like, you know, animal puppets uh, um, uh, finding themselves in this, uh, um, you know, this uh, surroundings and the situations and I, I think um, I do like fun <laughs> or how do you say it? but I mean I do think that that humor is a quite important part and also like the best humor you know comes from dark places I'd say which is a bit cliche but that's true you know and and um, so I think it's it's but but I I, I I rarely try to be funny it's not like oh this scene this are, this is supposed to be funny but it's more like i sort of just um i just uh, let my characters meet this situation and this surrounding and just see what happens and usually something fun comes from that like for example when Todd puts a tea bag to <laughs> <laughs> to represent the letter t <laughs> När de mest underfundiga hälsningarna kändes slitna började Tord utveckla sina meddelanden. Till exempel kom han på att man inte behövde skriva hela namnet Tord 
utan elegant förkortade till ett T. Och ibland kunde han vara finurligare än så. You mentioned animals, all of, all of these films. Yeah have animals in them. The one thing which which has always struck me is like nothing much moves in their face mm. apart from their eyes. Mm. But they they kind of offer so much emotion. Mm. Um, but why is it why did you choose animals to represent these characters? And and what is your process in terms of like, well this character needs to be a seal or this one needs to be a, mm. a mouse or I think that process is not necessarily um very what do you say i mean i i think it's um i do think i just come up with with some animals and it's not it's not that i really choose that precise animal for that character it's just like something that just like evolves naturally i i, I don't know how to say anything else than that but but like when it comes to working with animals in general it's i think like one reason is that I don't really feel comfortable with human puppets. I think I, I haven't really found a way into because I, I make my puppets like the puppets I always make myself and um, like most of the sets as well. But then I often like co-work with with Niklas, my set designer. Um, but the puppets I make myself and and um, uh, I, I could never really find a style uh, in the human like appearance that I, I like I think it's hard and um, and also I do think that like like we spoke about before I think there comes like some sort of uh, it, it becomes interesting to watch animals in this like very like human situations with like this human um, um, emotions and uh, and um, uh, actions so so I I am um, um, now, now it feels. I think, like, comparing to like my first film, and now, now it's very, like, I think that's a very big part of my uh, universe. Uh, and I also like to think of um, these animal characters as some sort of like, you know, modern fables as well. That my films are like modern fables. That, that's like, like traditionally old. These old fables are very much. They were like, you know. Um, kids stories uh, uh, as you know like officially like kids stories and and then they had like layers of like criticizing the you know government or whatever but that couldn't be told uh, upright so they needed to sort of like hide their messages with uh, cute animals instead and I, I think I think there's some sort of similarity to my stories um, I think they like it, it's fun to sort of like also sort of invite the audience into this like sort of quite dark context with this sort of cuteness filter you know this like silly and and sometimes cute puppets that's that's suffering from like mental illness or uh, existential anxiety or <laughs> whatever you know well that that kind of brings us to the burden yeah. and, and i'm thinking about a certain scene where the the monkeys at the end uh, singing about their life drifting away, but it's so enthusiastic, and they're throwing their their hands up in the air, and there's such a contrast there. But just just coming onto that film because that felt like um, just a bit of a step change from the previous two films. Mm. You developed your style, mm. um, but this this was some something else. And I, I've heard you talk before about how it was. You didn't have the budget you needed. No. You worked long and hard. I mean, you've mentioned that all your all your films take about two and a half years. Yeah. This one, I, I, I wondered, like, <clears throat> you reckon you, you had about 50% of what you needed in terms of money for, to make this film? Yeah, could have done much more as well. But, but yeah, definitely, definitely. Because that film was so brilliant and it did so well, yeah. I guess off the back of it, things have happened as well. Yeah. And, and, how important was it for you that actually you did make that film? And just thinking about other filmmakers who were struggling, that film being a very underfunded film, you made it how you wanted to, or at mm, least mm. to a certain extent. Yeah. Um, how important has that been for you? And would you recommend others doing the same, just <laughs> actually going through the pain and doing it? I would sort of say like, don't try this at home. <laughs> because it's really, it's really like, yeah, it was kind of a, not really 
human process to to make that film uh, in many ways. But but I mean, of course, I wouldn't change a bit uh, looking back because that film has you know has meant everything to me really. It's it's a uh, uh, that's why I'm here now in, in the UK making a whole lot like bigger production and it's been opening so many doors. So, so, um, so, I, and also like, like definitely because I, I think it became very good. I think it's like, uh, I'm very happy about that film. And I think it's like, I'm also very happy that so many people, uh, did get very like struck by it or, or like emotionally, you know, involved. <laughs> so, so I, I think uh, I'm very like grateful for that. Beklaga, be om ursäkt, men här aldrig avtalet. Du får inte en andra chans att göra ett bra intryck. Jag förstår, jag förstår, jag förstår, jag förstår. Jag förstår era problem. Men förstår ni mina? För jag har inga drömmar Inga behov Jag kräver inte mycket Mitt liv to feel if a project is sort of worth uh, fighting for, you know, because I, I did feel from the beginning that like this really has something, um, like this idea somehow and, and like a certain, you know, I, always, I also was so happy to, because I, the first like couple of scenes I did while I was taking my masters in uh, in art school, so I did have some like uh, room for you know just trying things on. And also, I did the first scenes, and then I could like share the first scenes a little bit with um, with the, an audience because I, I used them as my like exam work. So so that was very um, very like uplifting, and and to see that I think that was the the hotel long stays in the fish scene, which I personally started with because I felt like yeah this is kind of the weakest scene. It's not too much happening, you know. It's not compared to like the monkey scene or like uh, so I didn't have so much expectations on that scene. But then I just realized when uh, that people were like so moved by that scene, uh, which obviously is also because of the work of, of my composer Hans Appelqvist, or <laughs> the composer, uh, and Martin Luke who wrote the lyrics uh, together with me. So, so, of course, this is a bit of a teamwork, but it became so powerful somehow in its like low key. Um, what do you say? Like being so low key, and and um, so I think I was very. Uh, that that sort of drove me to to continue to work, um, and it was also. I mean, like. It's, I do. I do have some kind of tendency to be a bit like, "This is impossible." Then let's do it. You know, like being a bit like cocky somehow, and just uh, and also being a bit like very optimistic about time and resources, and just like, "Oh, I'll just do that at home at night," and it takes like you know three months, and it's like, I, I, and I think that's that sort of. Um, uh, thinking, which is quite, you know, that's just me being bad at like planning and uh, <laughs> like being very much just that will take no time at all and it takes, you know, two years. But um, uh, I think that's what's made me also continued working because I, I, I can never really see the whole picture. <laughs> like, I can never really see the whole process. I'm just sort of like maybe one week ahead uh, constantly. <laughs> So, and so, like thinking about that, then when you you you've got yourself into something and it's taking a, a seemingly long yes. time, when are you happiest in terms of you know the process of the filmmaking? Mm -hmm. When are you really like, yeah, this is? Yeah, uh, I think I'm most happy 
when I don't feel too stressed about things, which you usually are about everything, but but also if I if I have like the time and the the peace to sort of just you know being able to 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 build stuff really, and and I feel like I can really like find that feeling of joy when when I sort of like discover. Uh, like a certain kind of like material that sort of imitates uh, uh, a real material somehow like, oh, that's sort of, um, what do you say, that's sort of, um, uh, what can I say, like that's sort of, uh, that sort of fabric is exactly like a towel, but like in a much smaller scale. It's like, oh, this will be perfect because I do, I do find it very uh, fun to sort of, um, to, to, to sort of remake reality in, in small scale and really like uh, finding ways to do that, uh, that makes me really happy. And also, of course, like when, when you know, sitting in the grading department, just doing the grading, that's, that's also a really nice feeling, just like do the, like the final touch and everything, that's nice. When it all comes together. Yeah. Um, you mentioned working with a composer. Mm -hmm. I mean, the, the soundtrack to The Burden is, is, is incredible. And in fact, last time I spoke to you, you said you were going to talk about releasing a, a vinyl of it. Yeah, it's, uh, it's already been done. No, done. no one bought it, though. <laughs> I have like 150 vinyls at home. Well, if you want to buy a vinyl, yeah. you should, exactly. Yeah. Just email me, please. Um, but can you talk a bit about working the music for that one and for your most recent film, mm. and also um, the the writing, because mm. you work with a comedy group. Yeah, or, or the the writing for the bird, like the lyrics writing for the bird, and, and uh, uh, something to remember was made by Martin Lucas. Uh, like he's an author and a comedian, and he was part of like a very very famous comedy group in Sweden called um, Schillingenget. But um, now he's mainly an author and and a scriptwriter, and he's like he's such a it's hard describing him as such a genius person, and it's like I ha I get the idea about like what what kind of theme I want for the for the lyrics. Like for example, in the hotel in the burden, I want like it's about like this sort of lonely uh, individuals, like and they have their different reasons, and and it's a, it's very like melancholic, and and then I can just like give Martin the, this sort of instructions and, and he, he can just find these precise words that are like so, you know, sort of like naive but still very like precise and the humor is so like, oh, I think it's so like on point and so dry and I think it's just such a perfect way of describing life, you know, so, so I'm super happy to work with him. Om <laughs> Eller inte vill vara med någon Eller inte kan vara med någon Eller ingen vill vara med dig And also Hans Appelqvist uh, wrote like this original music for The Burden. Uh, he's also been the sound designer of my previous films. Uh, he's, he's a musician, like an artist himself and he's incredible. Um, not like in the exact same way that he makes music for my films, but he's, he's really, really good. And uh, it, was actually, it was actually quite fun because uh, like complaining about uh, uh, the, the, the bad budget for the bird, and we actually sort of decided to kill the budget for day one uh, <laughs> in that production because we decided to like, yeah, we should really like have this music recorded by a live orchestra. Yeah, that makes sense. <laughs> because we wanted, I wanted it so bad to be very close to these like old school Hollywood musicals, like this sort of like singing in the rain and like in this kind of film. So, and, and so that sort of like live music, um, uh, live music uh, uh, sound was kind of important, which I still think it was. It, it was such a great thing, but that was quite expensive. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely, um, yeah. But he, he was he was so because he, he like making musical, um, you know, 
writing musical is not really his thing from the beginning, Hans. But uh, it was it's really fun that his his own style is sort of meeting my references. I was like sending him like West Side Story music and stuff, and then it sort of got filtered through him, and and it became so. I think it's so lovely. Was that out of the blue? Did you know him previously? How how did that? How I've known him for a long time. We have like mutual friends and he's also, I think he, he's one of those persons who sort of also meant everything to me by, you know, he, he did the, um, the sound design of Tord and Tord, like, you know, for free without hardly knowing me. And that like, you have a few of those people that sort of like really helped out and just like sort of made my, you know, career somehow. And, and you know, made things move forward and become much more like professional and things. So, so I, I owe him everything for that. Also, like just for example, in um, in the burden, I, I had I got help from a, a real like tap dancing choreographer for that uh, tap dancing scene in the Hamburg restaurant, which is like you can't really just come up with a tap dance routine. It's like super complicated. Uh, so that was also it, it's a it's a woman called Denise Holland Betke, and she's. She's like quite famous uh, choreographer for tap dancing in like musicals in, in Stockholm and Sweden. And I didn't know her at all. And I just called her and like, hi, I have no money at all. Could you please help me do a tap dance uh, choreography for this uh, scene? And she was like, sure, I'll do that. And then she recorded herself doing like dancing and we could use that as a reference for the animator. And it's like, you know, these things are just so nice. You should like never forget how how important it could be to, and I, I also try to remind myself that I need to like be very generous towards like, you know, younger creative persons or like artists or filmmakers to just like to help them come through because it's so hard to make like really good things if you haven't, like if you have, haven't like the contacts with like professionals in in certain areas, you know. So looking back then over the over the last decade or so, um, what you know what the lessons learned? What what? How have you got to where you are now? Um, and we'll just we'll briefly talk about where literally we are now and mm -hmm. what what you're doing. Um, but what tips can you offer to to filmmakers? Um... I think it's worth, I mean, if you really believe in, in a film uh, or like a project that you're working with, I think, I think it's like you need to be aware of, especially when, when, when you're more new to it or younger, I mean, like there will definitely be quite a lot of hours of very hard work, like very hard work, like physically and, and mentally. And, and I mean, I, you, you can't even be sure that it's, you know, wor worth it. I mean, like, but I have always, I haven't really been, you know, career climbing like that at all. That, like, don't really have that sort of planning for the future at all. It's just been like, you know, things just within my very near future that I'm thinking about. So I have no idea what to do next from this you know it's very like just you know whoa oh this is nice oh, you know so um uh but also i think like what's been really good for me and what i would recommend is also to to sort of lose your what do you say like lose your um don't be like shy to to reach out to people that you sort of want to work with uh because i feel that many of these collaborations that I've done that have really made my film so much better. It's been because I just, you know, you you know someone from, I don't know, from TV or from script writing or for, from sound design or whatever, and then you just, I, I've just been sort of like emailing them and, and like, hi, it would be so nice to work with you. Can I do like an internship or like, can I can I help you out in any way and maybe you can you know, get some feed I can get some feedback from you. And I think that's been very good to sort of not be shy of um, um, getting help and getting like uh, inspired by by people who has come a bit further or, or that's just sort of genius people in general. I think that's been very rewarding to me. So Yeah, so having that kind of proactive yeah. element. And, and so can you tell us a bit about what you are working on now? Yeah, 
<laughs> I'll try. It's it's obviously very secretive everything, but but it's a it's a Netflix project that's made by um, uh, Nexus uh, here in the UK, and uh, uh, I make one of three films. That's a part of an anthology, uh, stop frame anthology, uh, and the other two films are directed by. Mark Rose and Emma Desweff, and then also Paloma Baeza, uh, which are like so talented, like creatives and filmmakers. So it's like such an honor to be in this little gang, really. Uh, and uh, I'm right now. I, I've uh, traveled with my family to to um, Manchester, and I'm directing here in uh, at McKinnon and Saunders, which is like really a sort of dream coming true. Actually, it's like like 10 years ago, I was like dreaming of being a part of, of their art department because like I would like, I'm, I still do actually, I still <laughs> dream of being a part of their art departments. <laughs> but now uh, we're collaborating on this film and it's, uh, it's so amazing. It's really, I thought it would be, I mean like since my previous films had been so like crazy low budget and very like me, me, in a basement, basically, and now it's quite a bit of a bigger project here. But it's it's been quite um, it's been quite smooth, and everyone is just so incredibly talented and nice, and you feel really comfortable. So, so I'm I'm just uh, very happy about it all. It's it's great, except from COVID, of course. <laughs> it's a bit like it's a bit of a lockdown situation here. We need to have like face masks constantly and stuff. But that's I guess that's been the situation all the time in the rest of the world, except from Sweden. <laughs> yeah. 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 I won't say anything more about that. No. But, um, <laughs> but just, just finally, um, and just thinking about where you are now mm -hmm. and where you were 10 years ago, what, what are your ambitions? Do you, I mean, do you, do you have any plans to move away from animation? Do you want to move back into more the art world and exhibitions? Uh, feature films what's what's on the horizon and what do you want to do I do have like a project that's um, that I'm sort of been co-writing with uh, a great great um, script writer called Jan Silverman and that's also I'm collaborating with um, my Swedish producer Kalle Vetter and uh, the uh, American company Pastel uh, which uh, is Barry Jenkins uh, film company and, and we're sort of developing a project that would possibly be a series, but also perhaps a feature, it depends a little bit. Uh, that would be some sort of David Lynchian uh, thriller about the next possible like finance crash and, uh, <laughs> and some sort of like um, apocalyptic um, situation around that with, you know, with the usual like fish and slugs and <laughs> different kinds of characters. So I'm very excited about that project. I really hope that that will happen somehow. Um, but I'm not too, I'm, I mean, I, I'm, I've never felt like, I've never felt that interested to make like live action things. That, that's just a totally different, um, totally different way of working that I, I don't know, I, I feel like I'm much more towards building things. So if, I mean, I, I'd i love to do, I mean, I'll, I'll probably do some more sculptures, like some more like traditional sculptures um, when I have the time. Uh, and I think that that sort of like combination of, of, of you know, that kind of um, uh, art work and also uh, directing films would be like the best way of just continuing my life, I guess. <laughs> I'm very excited to see what happens with this Netflix project. It's, yeah. it's called... The, the House. Sorry, yes, The House. It's uh, when, very exciting. When can we expect to see it? I'm not sure that it's uh, it's uh, like an official premiere date yet, but, but it's it's obviously a bit delayed due to COVID, but it's still going quite well, I think. So, um, quite soon, I think. <laughs> 2021 at some point, possibly. Yeah, perhaps. Yeah, I... Perhaps. I think so. <laughs> I think so. <laughs> um, well, thank you so much for, for talking with us and, and for, for sharing your films with us. Uh, I, for one, have like, totally loved all four of your films. And, and for me, like I started 
programming and curating films um, after kind of seeing your your kind of like Todd and Todd and other yeah. other films like it. So it was really instrumental in in my career. Oh, um, so yeah, big thank you for me personally. But, yeah. Um, <laughs> Yeah, thanks so much. Yeah, thank you uh, so much for coming here. We can be at the Nordisk Panorama in person in the next few years. Yes, please. Next year, please. <laughs> yeah, thanks so much. Thanks.